Hello dear students, I am Dr. Moin. Students, as you know that we are discussing these days the fluorescence spectroscopy. So in this video, we will specific, specifically discuss the instrumentation of fluorescence spectroscopy. And this is part one. So in this part, we will see what is fluorometer, what is spectrofluorometer, and we will see the various source of radiations. So here is the fluorescence instrumentation. There are several different types of fluorescence instruments which are being used. And we know that in fluorescence spectrum, actually we get two spectra. One is emission spectra while other is absorption spectra. So the instrument use actually two wavelength selectors. So some of the instruments in some of the instruments, both of these two wavelength selectors are filters, while other may use monochromators. And some of the instruments, they may use both of these. So, if the two wavelength selectors are both filters, if both are filters, then the instrument is called fluorometer. And if both wavelength selectors are monochromators, then the instrument is called spectrofluorometer. While, uh, as I told you earlier, that some instruments, they use both of these, that is, they are hybrid. Mean, they use an excitation filter along with emission monochromator. And these are also known as spectrofluorometer. So here you can see the difference between the fluorometer and spectrofluorometer. While all the fluorescence instruments, whether they are fluorometer or spectrofluorometer, they imply double beam optics, mean they split the radiation into two beams. So they employ double beam optics. So in this video, we will discuss spectrofluorometers in detail. With most of the spectrofluorometers, it is possible to record both excitation and emission spectra. Now what is emission spectrum? Actually it is the wavelength distribution of an emission measured at a single constant excitation wavelength or vice versa. Mean if we are talking about the absorption spectrum then it will be opposite and the spectra these can be presented on either wavelength scale or a wave number scale I mean on x-axis you will find either what do you say uh, you will find wavelength uh, either wavelength or wave number the usual units for wavelength are nanometers while for wave number it is given in per centimeter however in most of the fluorescence spectrum we see the wavelength scale on the spectra so here is the schematic diagram of spectrofluorometer and since it's spectrofluorometer so it uses two monochromators one is excitation monochromator while other is emission monochromator so here is the light source which is usually seen on arc lamp. So light comes from here enters into this excitation monochromator through this entrance slit. Now this excitation monochromator it uses dual gratings. And what is the purpose of using this dual grating? So for uh, what do you say so that the polychromatic light can be converted into monochromatic light properly. So the monochromatic light it exits out from this exit slit and further it falls on this beam separator. So beam separator actually it splits light into two equal beams. So two beams of equal intensity. So one is the sample beam while other is the reference beam. So here is the phenomenon of absorption which is recorded here is the detector that is photomultiplied tube. And then there here is the emission phenomena so the light 
enters into this emission monochrome matter and then upon falling through different grading devices it falls on this detector so here the emission spectrum is what do you say Meyer so both of these monochrome matters here is the control system for these two monochrome matters so you uh, we can uh, select the wavelength of our interest from here and finally we get the fluorescent spectra displaying both emission and absorption spectras here is a further explanation of the process the instrument has xenon lamp as a source of exciting light and these lamps are generally useful because of their high intensity at all wavelengths ranging upward from 250 nanometer the instrument is equipped with monochromators to select both excitation and emission wavelengths the excitation monochromator in this schematic diagram it contains two gratings so you can see here it contains two gratings and the purpose for using two gratings is that these decrease decrease the chances of stray light and what is stray light stray light is the light with wavelengths different from the chosen one means we have selected the wavelength from here but sometime there might be possibility that the radiation of other wavelengths may also pass through here mean the monochromator is not screening properly so that is why we use two grating devices to avoid these stray lights another way of avoiding the stray light is that the monochromators which are used here they use concave gratings and these concave gratings are produced holographically which also decreases the chances of these stray light both the monochromators are motorized to allow automatic scanning of wavelength and they are controlled from here the fluorescence is detected with photomultiplier tubes so photomultiplier tubes are used here as detectors and these are quantified with appropriate electronic devices and the output is usually presented in the form of graph in the form of spectrum and is stored digitally now we will see the various parts of spectrofluorometers in detail and the first one is the light sources so various light sources can be used are being used in spectrofluorometers and we will discuss them all in detail so first of one first one is arc and incandescent xenon lamps at present the most versatile light source is a high pressure xenon arc lamp these lamps provide a relatively continuous light output from 250 to 700 nanometer so radiation emitted through these lamps is a continuous radiation ranging the wavelength 250 to 700 nanometer and what is the process going inside actually xenon arc lamps emit a continuum of light as a result of recombination of electrons with ionized xenon atoms and how these atoms are ionized these ions are generated by the collisions of xenon atoms with the electrons that flow across the arc so when we connect these lamps through electricity so using the energy the atoms are ionized and when ionized atom get electrons back so the radiations are emitted so complete separation of the electrons from the atoms so these yield uh, the continuous emission xenon lamps are classified as being ozone free meaning that during the operation no ozone is generated there into the surrounding so these are pollution free lamps these xenon lamps are usually contained 
within specially designed housings so you can see here the xenon lamps and their housings the gas in xenon lamp that is filled under high pressure of about 10 atmospheric pressure so explosion is always danger in case of these lamps the housing protects the user from the lamp and also from its intense optical output but there is always danger of using these lamp and how's that a xenon lamp is that that is one should never be observed directly mean it may be dangerous towards our eyes and how it's dangerous the extreme brightness will damage the retina so it can cause damage towards retina and the UV light from it that can damage the cornea in our eye so it is referred that we must have to use the safety glasses when handling these lamps another important role of housing is for collecting and collimating lamp output and this light it is then focused into the entrance slit of the monochromator and the light and the life of these xenon lamps is about 2000 hours another source which is being used is the pulsed xenon lamps so output produced here is in the form of pulses or flashes means it is not continuous so the output of a flash lamp is higher in the UV region the peak intensity of these pulses is usually higher than that of the continuous arcs the flash lamps consume less power and generate less heat which is, which is their advantage another advantage is in some cases the lack of continuous excitation it can minimize the photo damage to the sample so this is another advantage of these pulsed xenon lamps and these are shown over here another light source is high pressure mercury mercury lamps so this is how they do look like generally and this one is the design being used in spectrofluorometers so in general mercury lamps have higher intensities than xenon lamps it's usually better to choose the excitation wavelengths to suit the fluorophore and this can be well done in case of these lamps these lamps are only useful if the mercury lines are at suitable wavelengths for excitation means their energy matches the energy uh, which is required to excite the atom from the ground state to excited state another light source is xenon mercury arc lamps which are shown over here so high pressure mercury xenon lamps are also available and these have also higher intensities in ultraviolet region as compared to the xenon lamps and their output is dominated by mercury lines but when we start the process so lamp output is mostly due to xenon in the start but as the lamp reaches the operating temperature all the mercury becomes vaporized so most of the population is due to mercury another light source is quartz tungsten halogen lamps these lamps provide continuous output and that is in visible region and IR region of the spectrum so previously these lamps were not useful for fluorescence because they have low output below 400 nanometer that is in UV region and are thus not useful for excitation of UV absorbing fluorophores however there is presently increasing interest in fluorophores absorbing in red and near IR region so for such fluorophores 
we are preferring these quartz tungsten halogen lamps another light source is low pressure mercury and mercury argon lamps these lamps yield very sharp line spectra that are useful primarily for calibration purposes so these lamps are being used specially for the calibration purposes of the instrument previously the lamps contained only mercury but now some lamps they are containing both mercury and argon mercury produces lines below 600 nanometer while argon produces lines above 600 nanometer the next light source is led light sources leds are just beginning to be used at, as light sources in spectrofluorometers a wide range of wavelengths are available with leds so to produce to get a wide range of wavelength an array of leds can be used and unlike a xenon lamp these do not generate significant infrared radiations so heat is not produced too much so that is why there is no use of there is no need to use heat filter in case of leds leds have the advantage of long life and low power consumption the use of leds as an excitation source is likely to broaden in near future and the last but not least source is laser diodes in contrast to leds laser diodes emit monochromatic radiations so these produce what do you say the radiations of single wavelength laser diodes are available with wavelength ranging from about 405 to 1500 nanometer laser diodes are convenient because the output is easily focused and manipulated so here you can see the laser diode and these are producing the radiations of different wavelengths the monochromatic light so dear students this is all about today's video if you didn't subscribe my channel yet then subscribe it right now because in the upcoming videos we are going to discuss the rest of the parts of spectrofluorometers so thanks for watching thank you very much